And part A, we're going to expand and simplify these brackets. So starting with the expand part, um, we simply have to make sure that every term in the first bracket is multiplied once by each term in the second bracket. I like to do this by doing little arrows across. So 7 times 3 is 21. 7 times minus 5. Remember the minus sign is really with the 5 there. Um, bigger pardon, root 5. So 7 times minus root 5 is minus 7 root 5. Um, so the 7 is multiplied by each of them. We just have to do the same for the root 5. Root 5 times 3. Um, and it's positive, so it's plus 3 root 5. And finally, root 5 times minus root 5. So root 5 times root 5 is just 5. So that's minus 5. So that's the expand part. The simplify part, we can see that we've got 21 and minus 5. They're just ordinary rational numbers. So 21 take away 5 is 16. And then we've got two terms in root 5. One is minus 7 root 5, the other is plus 3. So combine those together to give minus 4 root 5. And that is part A. Now for part B, uh, we have this uh, fraction here, and we have to express it in the form A plus B root 5. So basically we need to get rid of this denominator, get rid of um, the 3 plus root 5 by rationalizing the denominator. And the process there is to look at what we've got on the bottom and think what could we multiply that by so that the whole thing would become um, a rational number. So we get rid of the thirds. And the key is we've got 3 plus root 5 here. And so using the difference of two squares, if we multiply it by 3 minus root 5, that's the trick that we need. Okay, so if we, and of course we have to do the same thing to the numerator. We can't multiply a denominator by something and not do the same to the numerator, otherwise we're completely changing the value of the fraction. Okay, so we're going to have 7 plus root 5 over 3 plus root 5, and we have to multiply top and bottom by 3 minus root 5. So you can write it like this, 3 minus root 5, 3 minus root 5, we could write it as one big fraction um, with 7 plus root 5 times 3 minus root 5 on the top, 3 plus root 5 times 3 minus root 5 on the bottom. Now at this point it's worth pointing out that what we've got on the numerator on the top, 7 plus root 5 times 3 minus root 5, that's what we did in part A. Okay, so we know that the numerator is going to look like this. So that's done for us. So that helps. So now for the denominator, I have to do 3 plus root 5 times 3 minus root 5. Okay, so we know, I'll just rewrite the numerator, 16 minus 4 root 5. The denominator, I'm going to put a middle step in here, but you might not always need this. I wouldn't normally do this if I was doing it on my own. Um, think about doing... 3 times 3 gives you 9, and then the 3 times the minus root 5 is minus 3 root 5. Then we do root 5 times a 3, that's plus 3 root 5, and the root 5 times the minus root 5, that gives you minus 5. Now the whole point of what we've done here, why we've multiplied top and bottom by 3 minus root 5, is that these two bits cancel each other out. It's the difference of two squares. So we end up with 3 squared take away root 5 squared, i.e. 9 take away 5. So these things cancel out. Get rid of those. And so we're left with the numerator is unchanged, 16 minus 4 root 5. And all we have is 9 take away 5, which is 4. Now we wanted it in the form a plus b root 5, and we see that if you look at the numerator, both the terms there are divisible by 4, so we can split it up. 16 divided by 4 is 4, and minus 4 root 5 divided by 4 is simply minus root 5. And there we have our answer. Okay, part 
A of this question. Um, once you've learnt it, it should be dead easy and super quick. We should recognise that the power of half means a square root. So if you want to write some working, you can write square root of 25, but you can go straight to the answer of 5. Um, it's one mark, strictly speaking, it should be plus or minus 5, but most of the time you'll get away with just 5 um, for the simple question like this, but always consider um, positive and negative roots. Part B, this is more tricky. 25 to the power minus 3 over 2. There's tons of stuff going on here. We've got negative power and we've got a fractional power. And people tend to get those mixed up. So let's just deal with them one at a time. The negative power, that means you take the reciprocal. That means if it was a fraction, you'd flip it upside down. In this case, 25 isn't a fraction, so but we replace it with 1 over 25. So 1 over 25, rather than 25, that deals with the minus sign. So I've still got my power, it's around all of it, but the minus sign is gone because I've taken the reciprocal, I've flipped it upside down. So now I'm just dealing with uh, fractional power. And the thing to remember about fractional powers is that the denominator, in this case 2, that tells you the root that you're going to take. So 2, um, just like it did up here, means take the square root. The numerator of your fraction, in this case 3, that's the power that you're going to take. So we have to cube it. So we have to do two things. We have to cube 1 25th and we have to take the square root. And you can do it in any order, but um, the only sensible order is to square root it first because then you're not trying to cube um, 25. So we square root it first. And if you're square rooting a fraction, you simply square root the numerator and the denominator. So the square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 25 is 5. So we've done the square root, we've dealt with the 2 part of my fraction. All I need to do now is cube that. And so you simply cube the 1, which is 1, and cube the 5, which is 125. Job done. OK, a typical question on simultaneous equations involving one linear equation, which is x plus y equals 2, and one quadratic equation, 4y squared minus x squared equals 11. OK, so I'll call those 1 and 2. Um, now, unlike the situation when you've got two linear equations, when one has x squared in or y squared, you 9 times out of 10 are going to solve it by substitution and rather than trying to eliminate by adding or subtracting. Um, so we need to either replace y squared in this equation with something from equation 1 or replace x squared. Now you always look to replace the simplest one. Um, in this case the x squared there's just one of it but it's minus so you want maybe be careful about that. The y squared you have to multiply it by 4 but you might decide that that is safer than worrying about the minus sign here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace y squared in equation 2 with what it is from equation 1. So if I look at equation 1, I can rearrange that by subtracting x from both sides. If I subtract x, I get y equals 2 minus x. OK, so now I can substitute that directly into equation 2. So what I get is 4, and now instead of y squared, I don't want y, I want to get rid of it. Every time I see y, I'm going to replace it with 2 minus x. So instead of y squared, I have a bracket with 2 minus x in it, and I have that squared. And now I just write out the rest of equation 2. So I've got minus x squared equals 11. Um, so I've got to multiply out my brackets. So I'll put my 4 there, and then multiply out the brackets. So um, well, I'll write out the step that I'd advise a lot of you to do. You won't all need to do this, but it can avoid some careless mistakes or avoidable mistakes. So multiplying out this bracket, you're going to have 2, oops, that goes to there, 2 times the 2, which is 4, put that bracket there, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times minus x, minus 2x, minus x times 2 is also minus 2x, and minus x 
times minus x is plus x squared. So all of that has come from this bracket here. And then we still have minus x squared, we still have equals 11. So now I can tidy this up inside the bracket. So uh, 4 minus 4x plus x squared minus x squared equals 11. So all I've done so far is I've replaced y in my original equation with 2 minus x and tidied it up. So now I'm going to multiply out the bracket here. So um, 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times minus 4x minus 16x. And 4 times x squared is plus 4x squared. Then I have the minus x squared from here equals 11. Now you should recognize at this point that what you're trying to do is you're trying to find out the x values and you have a quadratic equation. So you're looking to simplify that and get it into the standard arrangement where everything is on one side of the equal sign and you're left with equal zero on the other side. So I'm going to gather everything on the left and I get rid of the 11 from here by subtraction. So what I'll have, first if I deal with 4x squared minus x squared, so that gives me 3x squared. Then I've got this minus 16x. Um, and then I have 16, but I have to subtract the 11. So 16 take away 11 is 5. So 3x squared minus 16x plus 5 equals 0. So now I have my quadratic equation. Okay, so now we have the usual question of how to solve this particular quadratic. It doesn't look straight away like a easy one to factorize, but the numbers aren't very complicated, so there's a good chance that we will be able to. It's worth a try at least. Um, and the way I would do this is to consider the terms a, the coefficients a and c, multiply those together, a, c is 15, and the coefficient b, the coefficient of x, is minus 16. And I'm looking for two numbers which will multiply to give 15 and add to give minus 16. So if they multiply to give 15, that means they both have to be the same sign to give a positive answer. So I'm looking for two negative numbers, okay, because they are add to give minus 16. Um, and after a while, you should be able to spot that this is minus 15 and minus 1. You can check for yourselves that they fit. And then the next step is to replace the minus 16x term with minus 15x and minus 1x. So I'll write that out. 3x squared minus 15x minus x and plus 5 equals 0. And then we look at adjacent pairs of terms and factorize those the old-fashioned way. So we just look at what goes into 3x squared and minus 15x. Well, in this case, it's 3x can come out of those two, leaving x minus 5. And using this method, you know that the bracket that you get here is going to be the same as the bracket that you get here. Okay, so I know if I've done it correctly, I should be able to get x minus 5 here. So I just have to think what's going to go in the middle. Um, in order to get that, I'm just going to have to have a minus sign, or effectively minus 1. Minus 1 times x gives me minus x. Minus 1 times minus 5 gives me the plus 5 that I want. And then finally, these two bits here, the 3x and the minus 1, they give me my second bracket. So 3x minus 1, x minus 5. Um, oops, I forgot my equals 0 up there. So that equals 0, and that's my factorized form. Okay, so to get my two values for x, I consider each bracket and think, what if that bracket was 0? Okay, so this one um, is fairly straightforward. You should be able to just see that x equals 5 from that bracket. This one here, if you can't see straight away what the answer is, just write a little equation, because you're considering this bracket being 0. So if 3x minus 1 equals 0, then 3x would have to equal 1, so x would have to equal 1 third. So x equals 5 or x equals 1 third. Are we done? Not quite. We have to work out the y values. We started with simultaneous equations involving x and y. We found the x solutions, but now we need to find the y values.
So to do that, we're going to substitute back into one of these two equations, our original equations, 1 and 2. And it doesn't really matter which one you do it in terms of what answer you get. You can substitute into either. But clearly, one of these equations is simpler than the other one. So the simplest equation is equation 1. So we substitute each x value into that. So when x equals 5, equation 1 gives me 5 plus y equals 2. So I subtract 5 from both sides. And y equals minus 3. And when x equals 1 third, then equation 1 gives me 1 third. That's about 3. Never mind. 1 third plus y equals 2. So you subtract a third from both sides, and we get y equals, well, 2 is 6 thirds, isn't it? So we take away a third from that, we get 5 thirds. So presenting our solutions as pairs, we have x equals 5, y equals minus 3, or x equals a third, y equals 5 thirds. And there you have your solutions. OK, here we go with part A. Uh, we have an inequality here. It's linear. There's no um, squares or anything in there. So 3 brackets x minus 2 is less than 8 minus 2x. Um, basically, we treat this like an equation, except uh, under certain circumstances, and we'll see what happens as we go through. Um, so the first thing we would do here is to expand the brackets. OK, so 3 times x. 3x, 3 times the minus 2 is minus 6. That is less than 8 minus 2x. We want to gather the x's all on one side and get the numbers over on the other side. So here, um, I get rid of that by adding 2x to both sides. So 3x plus 2x gives me 5x. So 5x minus 6 is less than 8. And get rid of this minus 6 from here by adding 6. So I get 5x is less than, well, 8 plus 6 is 14. So x is less than 14 over 5. And you can leave that as an improper fraction. OK, moving on to part b, we have another inequality. This time it's a quadratic. You can see that because if you multiplied out these brackets, you would have 2x squared as one of your terms. And so we have to treat these slightly differently. Um, this one's only worth three marks instead of four because they factorized it for you. So we don't have to factorize the quadratic. We just have to take the factorized version and go from there. So we look at our two brackets. These are going to give us our two critical values. Um, then we'll use these to decide the range of values that x can take. So 1 plus x, if that bracket was 0, then x would be equal minus 1. And 2x minus 7, if that bracket was 0, uh, 2x would equal 7, so x would equal 7 over 2. So these are my critical values. Okay, They're not my solutions. Um, my solutions aren't going to be x equals something, they're going to be a range of values for x. So now um, these, these values are going to determine my solution, but I need to determine whether x can be everything in between those two values. Um, so x would be greater than minus 1 and less than 7 over 2, or whether x is split between the values that are greater than 7 over 2 and less than minus 1. So if we imagine a number line here, and we've got uh, minus 1 here, we've got 7 over 2 there. Um, if we go back to our original expression here, if you imagine multiplying that out, the term involving x squared would be 2x squared. So it would be a positive term. And if you then to plot the graph of any quadratic with a positive coefficient of x squared, it looks like that rather than being that way up. So imagining that here, that's a very crude version of it, but it doesn't matter. Um, I want to know for what range of values of x is this function less than 0. OK, so if we were plotting it less than 0, it means below the x-axis here. OK, so the range of values for which um, this expression, the graph, would be below the x-axis is going to be everything between 
these two critical values. Okay, so the solution that we're looking for is the range minus 1 is less than x, which is less than 7 over 2. That's my solution to part B. Now part C is only worth one mark, so that should tell you something. There's not a lot here to do, and if you look at the inequalities that are given, they're simply the two inequalities that you've solved already. So you want the set of values for x which solves both of those inequalities. So at the same time, x must be less than 14 over 5, but it must also be between minus 1 and 7 over 2. Okay, 7 over 2, that's 3.5. 14 over 5, that's 2.8. So 14 over 5 is the lesser of the two. And if we were to sketch them all out on a number line along here, um, got minus 1, somewhere up here is 14 over 5, and somewhere up here is 7 over 2. My first inequality is telling me that x is less than 14 over 5. So using the notation that you learned at GCSE, everything that way. My second one is telling me that it's between minus 1 and 7 over 2. Okay, so the overlapping region is from here to here. So between minus 1 and 14 over 5. So my solution written out as an inequality is minus 1 is less than x, which is less and 14 over 5. That's your answer. Right, okay, so we've got a bunch of information here about um, points P and Q. We have coordinates of P, minus 1, 6, coordinates of Q, 9, 0. And another bit of information here about a line. And two facts. It's perpendicular to PQ, and it passes through the midpoint of PQ and we want an equation for L. So we have to use those two facts and the coordinates for P and Q. Um, it's always useful to do a, a very crude sketch of what's going on. So this is P, Q, doesn't matter if that's exactly how they're laid out or not. And our line L is perpendicular to PQ and it passes through the midpoint. So, oops, something like that, for which that's the middle, that's 90 degrees, these two are equal. So we need to find the midpoint, M, and we need to know then the gradient of this line, L, which we'll find because it's perpendicular to the segment line segment of PQ. So two facts to find out, then we can join them up and make um, the equation of line L. So the midpoint, let's find that first. Oops, lazy. Midpoint, M. And I always just like to think of this as it's the mean of the coordinates of the two other points. So the x-coordinate is going to be the mean of minus 1 and 9. So to find the mean, add them together, divided by 2. The y-coordinate will be the mean of 6 and 0. Add those together and divide them by 2. So minus 1 plus 9 is 8, divided by 2 is 4. 6 plus 0 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. So that's my midpoint, 4, 3. The next thing I need to know is the gradient, um, and the gradient of PQ, the line segment, um, I'll call that little m1. Um, so I'm going to use the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Think of it as the difference in the y coordinates divided by the difference in the x coordinates. So my y coordinates, I'm going to have 6 minus 0. My x-coordinates, make sure I get it the right way around, minus 1, take away 9. And if I look at that, uh, 6 minus 0 is 6, minus 1, take away 9, is minus 10. So 6 over 10 is 3 fifths, but we're dividing by negative, so it's minus 3 fifths. That's the gradient of PQ. So the gradient of L, the line that I want, I'll call that M2. Well, it's perpendicular to the line segment PQ, so I want the negative reciprocal. So minus 1 divided by minus 3 fifths. 
you can think of it as how it's written um, a number divided by a fraction but you know that when you take the reciprocal of a fraction you flip it upside down so that gives you 5 over 3 so 3 over 5 and negative reciprocal means we change the sign if it's already negative it becomes positive okay you don't need to write a positive sign there but that's what's there um, so we now know that the line L1 passes through this point here 4 3 and it has a gradient 5 thirds all you need for a straight line is a point that it passes through and the gradient so you may choose to do y equals mx plus c. I tend to follow y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1, where x1 and y1 are the coordinates of the point on the line. So in this case, y minus 3 must equal 5 thirds of x minus 4. So I've got my equation. Um, but I can't stop there because it wants it in a particular form, ax plus by plus c equals 0, where a, b, and c are integers, and that's crucial. So I can't have this fraction 5 thirds, so I'm simply going to multiply everything by 3 and see what happens there. Um, so 3y minus 9, and on the right-hand side, multiplying by 3 effectively just gets rid of this from the bottom here. So I'm left with 5 times x minus 4 and if I expand that that's 5x minus 20. So all I need to do now is gather the x and y terms and the constant term all on the same side and it actually doesn't matter which side. So I'm going to put them all on the left so I'll have 3y I've got to move this over by subtracting so minus 5x and I have to add 20 to both sides to move that over so minus 9 plus 20 is plus 11. So 3y minus 5x plus 11 equals 0. That's my equation. Right, part A of this question, we're asked to show that this expression x squared plus 6x plus 11 can be written as x plus p squared plus q, where p and q are integers. Okay, so what this is asking to do is to complete the square. The question never says complete the square, but that's what we're doing. So we take our expression, and for the time being, we disregard the plus 11, and we just look at this. Completing the square, we want to re replace this bit that I've underlined with x plus something squared. OK, plus an adjustment, which we'll do in a minute. So if we multiplied this out, x plus something, whatever goes here, we'd get two lots of that times x. So you know that the number that goes, that goes here is always half of the coefficient of x from here. So half of 6 is 3. Now if you imagine expanding those brackets, x plus 3 squared, you get your x squared, you get two lots of 3x, so that would give you the 6x, but you'd also get plus 9. And there's no plus 9 up here. So we have to subtract 9 to adjust for that. OK, so what I've written there, x plus 3 in brackets squared, take away 9, that's the same as x squared plus 6x. So I still have to write plus 11. OK, so that's the first stage there. And then all we have to do after that is tidy up the minus 9 plus 11. So we're left with x plus 3 squared minus 9 plus 11 is plus 2. OK, so you're not required to state it but the p value is 3 and q equals 2. All right, part b. Sketch the curve with the equation y equals x squared plus 6x plus 11. So that's y equals the function that we've just been playing around with. Okay, now the great thing about the form that we've just put it in is that it shows us where the minimum point is. OK, the minimum value that this function can have has to be when this bracket is 0. Because it's a bracket squared, it can only either be positive or 0. So to make the whole thing as small as possible, this would have to be 0. So the minimum is when x plus 3 equals 0. So that comes at x equals minus 3. And if that bracket is 0, then all we're left with is the plus 2. So y equals 2. 
So we're going to have a minimum at minus 3, 2. So that's the, uh, the first point that we need to plot. We also need to show where it crosses coordinate axes. So first of all, anything that, that has a minimum point y equals 2, um, and we know that it's this shape, Okay, we know that because it has a positive coefficient of x squared. Um, so the minimum value is at y equals 2, so that means we're above the x-axis somewhere. So it's never going to cross the x-axis, so we don't have to be concerned with that. We just have to figure out then where it's going to cross the y-axis. And for that, we just want to go back to this original form. Because in this form here, um, this gives us our y-intercept plus 11. And think about it like this, it crosses the y-axis when x is 0. And when x is 0, that's 0, and that's 0, so all you have is y equals 11. So if you want to sketch that now, you will do it using a ruler. I cannot using this software, but this is the best I can do. So these are my axes. I know it has a minimum point at minus 3, 2, so I'll mark my minimum point there, and it crosses the y-axis somewhere up here. Um, but I won't label that yet. I'll draw my curve and I'll label it when it passes through. So it's going to look something like that. And so I can mark this as 11. I can mark this point here as that being 2 and that being minus 3. And there we have it. The only detail I'd say about this is obviously you've got to have your axes labelled. So X and Y. And I'm not happy with this bit here of the curve because it goes straight up. Okay, so try and avoid that. Um, this bit is better. Um, a quadratic never ends up going straight up. It's always at an angle, even if it's very steep. Right, a nice little transformations question here. We're given a sketch of Y equals F of X and we have to perform these various transformations. The key information that we've got, local maximum point at minus 2, 3, and local minimum point there, and we can also see it goes through the origin. Okay, so we want to give as much detail as we can in our solution, um, but paying attention to the fact that in the question it says, on each diagram show clearly the coordinates of the maximum and minimum points. So that's the main detail that we need to be showing. So let's look at part A. We need to do this transformation here. Replace f of x with f of x plus 3. Um, whenever you have a constant added or subtracted within the bracket, um, it means all your x values are being replaced, in this case, by x plus 3. So rather than doing f of x, say, here, you'll be looking for x up here, a bit further along, and doing f of that. So it's pulling these values and taking them back there. So the whole curve is shifting that way. The quick way to remember it is that if it's inside the bracket it's moving left and right and the direction is sort of opposite to the sign. So a positive, uh, we've got plus 3 here, that means it's going left. So if we briefly examine what's going to happen to the key points here, uh, point A is just going to move to the left so the y coordinate won't change, the x coordinate is going to become minus 5 so it'll be minus 5, 3. The y um, sorry, the, the point B, that is quite interesting because it's going to move to the left by 3, so the x-coordinate is going to go from being 3 to being 0. So that's going to put across at 0, minus 5. So now we can go ahead and draw our axes. I want to see you doing this using a ruler. Um, this is the best I can do under the circumstances. Not great, I know. So I know it's going to have a minimum point somewhere down here and a maximum point somewhere up there. So I'll draw my curve and then label the points. Yeah, not too bad. So this one here is minus 5, 3. This one here is, what did I say it was, 0, minus 5. This point, we're not asked to label where it crosses the axes, but it was at the origin, so that's going to be at minus 3. All right, part B, y equals f of x is going to be replaced by y equals 2f of x. So 
we're taking the curve that we had and all the y values are two times what they would have been they're doubled so that's a stretch parallel to the y axis scale factor of 2 and this is a nice one to sketch again use a ruler please because you can sketch it just looking exactly like the one that they've drawn and then change the scales okay so that's my x-axis and the y-axis um, I just have to label these key points here rather than being minus 2 3 this maximum point is going to be minus 2 6 because all the y values have doubled and this one here rather than being 3 minus 5 it's going to be 3 minus 10 because again the y values have doubled and that is still my origin okay finally for part C we're asked to consider a the graph of y equals f of x plus a. Now when you just add a constant to your function you're really just adding that constant to all your y values. All your y values in this case are increasing by a. So the whole thing has to move up by a. And we're told that if we plot that graph it has a minimum point at 3, 0. That's here. Okay so it would have to move up from 3 minus 5 to 3, 0, it'd have to use, move up by 5 units. And the only way that can happen is if a equals 5, because you're adding 5 to all your y values when you plot it. That's why it's worth one mark. You don't have to do any calculations.